In this uh, session, we're looking at China's approach to counterterrorism, and uh, uh, we'll be thinking about uh, policies and implications of the, the current situation. And we have Dr. Mei Jian Rong uh, from the Chinese People's Public Security uh, Bureau, so uh, uh, University of China, sorry. And so uh, please join me in welcoming him to the session. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, dear friends and uh, colleagues. Uh, in fact, uh, it's a great honor of mine to stand here in this uh, pre uh, famous uh, university and uh, speak to uh, all these uh, established scholars and experts. And uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I come from uh, uh, Public Security University of China in Beijing. So this afternoon, my talk is about China's approach to counterterrorism policy and uh, implication. Uh, because of my uh, Chinese accent, in fact, uh, uh, local ex accent of uh, Hubei province, where I came from. So I write my presentation the slide in very detail so that you could understood, understand my points clearly. Otherwise, my accent may uh, make you misunderstand what I say. So uh, when talking about it, uh, China terrorism and uh, counterterrorism, in fact, uh, there uh, is a very long uh, story. In fact, uh, this morning, uh, Mike uh, uh, outlined some kind of key questions uh, about this. Uh, this issue about China and its effort to counter terrorism is getting more wide attention in the international community. Uh, the Chinese government respond to this. Uh, so in uh, the national community, there are a lot of uh, skepticism uh, to uh, outsiders. So Chinese government respond to this uh, skepticism usually related to the issues of dual standards. Uh, while the debate on the dual standards seem to contain political and uh, utilitarian meanings, the jargon cliche, one man's terrorism is another uh, man's freedom fighter, reflect uh, the complexity facing media, academia, and the, personnel, and the government personnel in China and also in other countries. So by applying the above cliche to the context, could we say China's terrorism is in the United States? or another country's freedom fighter, or vice versa. U.S. terrorism is China's freedom fighter. My answer is very simple, no. Uh, why? Because I want to analyze this uh, question. So uh, I also case that, generally speaking, terrorism and counterterrorism should be examined with reference to the specific historical and the cultural context. Uh, this doesn't imply that uh, this paper adopts the relativity, uh, relative approach to the study of terrorism. Uh, rather than that, it attempts to take universalist or even the opposite approach to the study of terrorism. Uh, the relativity approach or absolutely uh, absolutism approach may have uh, their own. Uh, weeks. Uh, the first one may lead to the practical uh, quagmire of dual standards. The later one may negate the cause or dynamics of terrorism in a specific context. So with the above stance, this paper attempts to explore the following questions. Well, I want to explore in detail, but uh, in fact, some questions uh, finally I cannot or hardly answered uh, in detail. So this question include that, does China face a problem of, of terrorism? If yes, to what extent? If not, what does it mean that the China, Chinese government claim is face a terrorism threat domestically or internationally? And the second question is that, what approach that does the Chinese government take to address the problem of terrorism? The third question, what are the rationals and the essentials of the Chinese approach 
to counterterrorism. How have these rationals and the essentials been conceived, and what effects the approaches that have been or will be taken? And the fourth question is about after introducing China approach in paper in this paper part three and analyze the essential approach and its relevance in part uh, in part four. This also specifically address sino australian counterterrorism cooperation and finally bring forth some suggestions on this cooperation in part five. So I want to address these kind of questions. So let's uh, go to uh, the first uh, issues. China face terrorism uh, is imaginary or factual, domestic or international, past, present. About terrorism facing uh, China, there are different uh, uh, narratives. Uh, so one official uh, account from the Chinese government. So uh, terrorism threat in China, the, this is the first source about uh, these issues. There are several important official documents addressing the violent activities perpetrated by some Uyghur terrorism group, including the leading one, EGRM. In different uh, eras, and uh, for example, in 2002, China State Council issued a white paper uh, entitled East Pakistan Terrorism Force Cannot Get Away with Impunity. So this is the uh, first one, also very important one. After that, Chinese government also issued uh, other white paper uh, regarding uh, situation in Xinjiang. So apart from the above specific white papers clearly addressing the issues on East Turkestan, the uh, two other white papers about ethnic unity and the freedom of religion belief in Xinjiang also was issued later. So specifically, the China Ministry of Public Security officially released the name list of terrorism and the organization in uh, three different years. China Ministry of Public Security designated four terrorism organizations and 25 persons on the list. By these channels and the products, China clearly announced that there are terrorism incidents inside and outside China. These incidents damage or pose threat to Chinese interest, interest domestically and internationally. And most of these incidents and threats are attributed to these four organizations, specifically, or to the so-called three evil force more generally. So this is China Chinese government official account. So the second source is the rejection of those accused. So for example, the World Uyghur Congress, one of the four designated terrorism organizations is very active. Uh, it's established on uh, April 16, 2004 in Munich in Germany. Uh, in this past, in, past, in this uh, just uh, July this year, the World uh, Congress, uh, Uyghur Congress uh, hold an uh, assembly in Paris. In fact, before the, uh, this uh, meeting uh, held by the World Uyghur Congress, I just uh, visited Paris and uh, held a meeting with the uh, uh, French uh, Interior uh, Ministry about uh, how to uh, uh, jointly uh, defuse this kind of threat. According to uh, Wikipedia, this organization is founded by part by National Endowment for Democracy, or NED, which gives uh, this organization this amount of money annually, uh, annually for human rights search and advocacy uh, out of a KC projects. Uh, this uh, organization is a US non profit organization founded in 1983 to promote democracy by providing cash grants funded primarily through a non allocation from the United States Congress. <coughs> so, what's the mission of this organization? Uh, this organization promoted uh, uh, is to promote democracy, human rights, and freedom for the Uyghur people and use peaceful, non-violent, and democratic means to determine, determine the political future. 
So this is the mission of this organization. And another uh, organization is uh, ETIM. In contrast to uh, WC, which claim to be a peaceful and non-violent movement for the collective interest of Uyghur people, ETIM, on the contrary, also known as TIP, or Turkestan Islam Movement, of openly advocate the use of violence to overthrow Chinese rule in Xinjiang and establish the independence of East Turkestan. ETIN and WC may have some difference. Nevertheless, there are some kind of basic similarity, I think. Both claim the independence of Xinjiang, East Turkestan, as they refer to it, denying that Xinjiang is a legitimate part of China. And both citizens both criticize the policy of China central government in Xinjiang. And both claim that there are many problems in Xinjiang, such as human rights abuse, intolerance of religious freedom and cultural assimilation. While ETIM <coughs> advocate the use of violence, WC proclaim the non-violent and peaceful movement. The nature and the goals of two movements are the same. The nature is separatism. The goal is founding the state the call as East Turkestan. So this morning, uh, uh, the discussion also raised uh, some kind of uh, uh, the, 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 these kind of issues, ETIM and, uh, and uh, other Uyghur movement, the difference, but uh, there are differences, but also they build some uh, similarities. The third source is uh, from the outsiders. So there are a lot of doubts. Facing these conflicting views on these issues, outsiders tend to feel perplexed. While some accept the conclusion of Chinese government, there are still many persons with different backgrounds for various reasons who have raised many questions, casting doubt on issues about terrorism in China. Principally, these questions may not necessarily be limited but most fall in the following categories. First, the doubt on the existence of terrorism, either terrorism organization or individual terrorism in China. The second, the doubt on the allegation of Chinese government. Are the allegations of Chinese government regarding the Uyghur consistent with the fact? Are the allegations exacted by Chinese government? And third, the doubt on the reason that lead to this incident of terrorism. Why did this perpetrator commit the violent act against Chinese government, Han National, and others? Is the oppression by Chinese government driving them to seek religious freedom and justice in other places like Turkey or even IS? Or have they been brainwashed by fundamentalist ideology and, and maneuvered by some outside force as the Chinese government alleged. And the fourth thought is about the legitimacy of policies and the measures taken by China against terrorism in Xinjiang and in other places. So regarding this kind of doubt, there are a lot of papers, articles. So, and also fifth, the doubt on the motivation of the Chinese government to fight terrorism. So some Persons say that that Chinese government suppress Uyghur descent under the cloak of the terrorism. And internationally, does the Chinese government use terrorism issue to strengthen some coalition like a SCO or to level the trade-off in geopolitical dialogues? So a brief of literature could illustrate these above points. For example, I just give some points like uh, uh, Dr. Shan Roberts examined some works like uh, the work entitled ETIM, China's Islamic Militants and the Global Terrorist Threat by Reed and uh, Diana Rasek, published in 2010. So Roberts found that these works are based on secondary source, as uh, this morning Dr. Roberts said that. And uh, a recent release, the report published by the New American in July, and uh, this report titled All Jihad is Local, what IS's file tell, tell us about its fighters, authored by Nate Rosenbrot, 
find that contextual evidence in China suggests that country's anti-terrorism campaign in Xinjiang could be a push factor driving people to leave the country and look elsewhere for a sense of belonging. This argumentation resonates the doubt on the reason that make terrorism in China. So this is a new one uh, report. And uh, a very interesting one is by uh, Mary Scott Turner, because uh, and another uh, uh, James. So this uh, uh, report, in fact, uh, uh, sponsored by U.S. Congress uh, uh, Commission on uh, China Economy and Security Issues. So in this report, uh, uh, Turner and uh, Scott, Turner Scott, uh, systematically introduce the background about terrorism in China and also China perception of terrorism threat, policy and bureaucracy, and finally address this issue about sino U.S. counterterrorism cooperation. And Turner asserts that while China does have a terrorism program and has suffered multiple terrorism attacks in recent decades, it is difficult to determine the nature and the magnitude of China's terrorism program. Uh, in fact, uh, Turner uh, visited Beijing several times, and uh, I met him at least uh, three times in Beijing, and so I uh, talked about something about uh, terrorism and uh, uh, bureaucracy uh, of terrorism in China. Uh, but uh, luckily, in his report, he didn't uh, uh, infer, refer to my name, and uh, because I don't know how my name was uh, referred. <laughs> so uh, while there are some kind of doubts, some positive feedback also existed. So, also, there are many controversy over the issue about terrorism in China. There is still some positive po feedback on the issue. In the practical sphere, since the September 11 attacks, EDM has been designated as a terrorism organization by many uh, countries. Also, uh, uh, in 2002, UN Security Council also cited EDM for, uh, on, the list, on the list. And uh, in the primary academic sphere, uh, they also, I just mentioned, uh, Todd Reed and uh, Diana found that found that ETM existence and activities should be confirmed independently of Chinese government source using information gleaned from ETM, no now defunct website reports from human rights group and academics, and testimony from the Uyghur detainee at the Guantanamo, Guantanamo Bay. So this is, uh, I think, is a uh, uh, positive feedback. So I just uh, mentioned the different source. I just, uh, so I'm um, very uh, interested in find that uh, uh, when talking about the terrorism threat to China, I think it may be considered as a rational, rational effect. Uh, yeah, this uh, film is a Japanese film directed uh, uh, by Akarara Kurosawa in 1950, which won an Oscar award. It's about, uh, in, uh, field of Japan, three men shattering from a storm, discussing an incident where a bandit raped a woman whose husband then somehow died. The film's innovative narrative structure recalls that individual isn't from four different view viewpoints. Uh, this film, I think, is very interesting and also uh, shed light uh, some kind of consideration on uh, when we consider the terrorism issues in China. So I think are there, uh, as there are different or even conflicting views on China terrorism issues, could these different narrative make the issues become a rational, rational effect? If it did, how could the truth be found and how? So all the above arguments seem to have their own logic of reasoning. This paper cannot definitely assess all views, or can it be verified some views unequivocally? Nevertheless, this paper can use some basic facts to make some judgment, which may be useful to disclose the needs of the Russian moon effect about China's terrorism. So I just want to uh, give out my uh, points. First, there is a terrorism threat to China, which is perceived as great by the Chinese government. This threat dates back decades, but in the past, it was called something 
uh, different. In Mao's time, it was uh, usually referred to as counter-revolutionary. Chang did not use the term terrorism, or even there were terrorism activities from uh, 1940s to 1990s in China. Uh, so Ch Chinese government uh, don't use that term, terrorism. Why? I can explain. The reason can be uh, uh, attributed to the following. First, the Communist Party doctrine that a state power comes from the use of violence. This is the first one. The second, uh, as Karl Marx in Manifesto of Communist Party says, uh, this uh, uh, doctrine. The second one is a gross experience of uh, Communist Party during Chinese Civil War, especially during 1920s and 1930s. That especially the massacre of Chinese communists in Shanghai in 2017, uh, uh, 1927 by the Kuomintang led by Chiang Kai-shek broke, broke the coalition between Communist Party and uh, KMT. Uh, Communist Party later called this period as the White Car Terror and uh, therefore launched the Red Terror to fight back. So in this civil, uh, civil war time, the so-called White Terror and, uh, uh, and the Red Terror, uh, in fact, uh, was uh, was were used to 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 the to term this kind of special period, and third, the special circumstance in Cold War, while the Soviet Union and the U.S. both used proxy terrorism groups, some leftism in Communist Party also sought to reinforce the role of China in the world political arena. At least uh, example is very uh, obvious in Lin Biao, then Defense Minister. He conceived the theory of exporting revolution. Lin Biao wrote Long Live the Victory of People's War in 1965. The publication, I think, was proved by Mao. So in this uh, article, Lin Biao, in fact, uh, advocated the exporting of revolution to other, to, to the third, to the developing countries. So due to this reason, China usually did not use the term terrorism to describe what is termed today as terrorism. So however, near the end of Cold War, Deng Xiaoping pointed out that peace and development had become the central theme of the post-Cold War era. And the code doctrine, uh, the old doctrine highlighting the use of violence and proxy war had faded gradually, especially after September 11, even took place, uh, events uh, took place in 2001 the new environment in the world marked the critical watershed of change in China's narrative of terrorism. So they changed a lot. So China dropped the old doctrine, which strengthened the politics in command, and adopted the new one, which prioritized economic growth to adapt a new circumstance. So the circumstance changed Chinese policy, and, uh, and uh, I think the policy's narrative also changed a lot. So in the current era, as the world environment changes, the new scenario shape the new concept of terrorism and its threat. So this morning, uh, discussion and the scholars mentioned several uh, terrorism attacks and also violent activities in China. For example, Tiananmen Square and the Kuomintang Railway Station attack, and also uh, in Wumuqi on this, uh, uh, this date, and also July 5th incident in Wumuqi 2009. I have a, a short video, just uh, very short. So this uh, incident, in fact, is a very important uh, uh, driving force for Chinese government to take the hard strike uh, policy. Because it happened just before President Xi Jinping visited uh, Xinjiang. So in fact, just after, just after Xi Jinping the plane take off, the incident happened in Wumuqi. So it, 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 this incident is considered as a, a, a very uh, serious uh, uh, threat to Chinese uh, uh, legitimacy rule in, in Xinjiang. So I think uh, there are uh, terrorism as a threat in China. And also this uh, incident happened uh, in China, but uh, overseas there are several big uh, incidents that happened and also changed the, the, the perception of Chinese leadership to this threat. The uh, first one is uh, the Chinese citizen and uh, killed by Islamic State and, uh, in, 2000, in 2015. And uh, this killing uh, sent a shockwave across China. 
And the second uh, is also in same year, and uh, the killing of uh, uh, Chinese uh, executive uh, in uh, Mali uh, by uh, violent group linked, uh, have some kind of linkage with Al Qaeda. So this kind of domestic and uh, OC is in in fact I think uh, change uh, the the perception of Chinese leaders. So all these attacks have profoundly shaped the new environment of Chinese domestic and overseas security, greatly impacted the perception of Chinese leaders and the public. So the current situation of Chinese of terrorism in China may be difficult to understand for outsiders, therefore a simple comparison between China and the UK may be useful to shed light on the understanding because uh, uh, I think it's very helpful for, our, for us to understand because uh, before I uh, take uh, I leave for uh, Australia uh, last month, I met a, a, a consul of a, a UK embassy in Beijing. I just gave him a, a very simple information that if you cannot carefully, uh, fully understand what happened in China, you go back to study the IRA in UK if, because there are many similarities. So uh, the threat and the response. Uh, so UK uh, once uh, faced the IRA threat and also similarly China now face ETM and other uh, three evil groups. Also similarly, there are uh, similar response in fact. Uh, UK's response to IRA and nowadays China respond to EDM and uh, uh, three evil force. There are many similarities. Uh, so I just uh, give some kind of simple analogy. And also, uh, very interesting information is that uh, I've got to uh, see a very interesting film in the name of the father. It's uh, cut in by uh, Daniel Dai Lewis. Because in that film, uh, a lot of uh, issues raised. So uh, when I uh, taught in our university, I also asked our university students must uh, uh, watch this film uh, because this film raised many uh, very important and uh, also very interesting issues regarding terrorism and counterterrorism. So second, uh, China terrorism uh, and or terrorism related groups cracked down by policy by police have increased nationally since 2013. According to Chief Justice report to National Assembly uh, in recent years, uh, these numbers uh, increased uh, obviously. For, for example, the case and, uh, and the groups and the persons, the groups uh, cracked down or uh, convicted by court and the person convicted by the court uh, increased, uh, increased. And third, patterns of MO of most groups could be identified. Uh, first, the ideology is a hybrid of uh, separatism and radical Islam. Uh, so uh, it's very important uh, to find that because, in, for example, uh, in 1930s and 40s, and most of these kind of groups, in fact, uh, are primarily based uh, separatism. But nowadays, the separatism ideology still exists, but also the new elements of radical Islam, I think, uh, uh, also uh, come together with uh, traditional separatism. So this uh, ideology uh, is a uh, uh, first uh, issue. Second, uh, weaponry, uh, IEDs <coughs> and knives and trucks and others also use this kind of weaponry. And the third, uh, recruitment, family and uh, uh, friends network. And uh, fourth, age of members, all of them are young. And uh, fifth, financing, uh, most of uh, self-financed, but uh, some of them also get funds from overseas. And uh, six radicalization dynamics, violent video clips from internet are the crucial tools to radicalize the youth. So this is a video released through the internet by ETM yearly increased. And the seventh travel route of uh, jihadists, the push in the uh, uh, poor effect make a su successful individual take the form of a child to move out of Xinjiang and tend to go abroad legally or illegally. This is the uh, internet uh, in the poll report, uh, also from Australia, New Zealand to some kind of uh, uh, stop in China, Guangzhou, 
or Tokyo or South Korea or Seoul, then to go to Turkey. But uh, this is in national uh, routes. But in China, also uh, the routes from Xinjiang to the central China, also there are two different uh, routes, north route and the south route. Then north route go to uh, Russia and the south route go to uh, uh, Malaysia and the Philippines and others. And the database uh, also a very important issue is database. So some uh, researchers find it's very difficult to uh, find kind of a reliable source of data about Chinese uh, uh, terrorism. In fact, uh, it's real. Uh, for, for me, I also faced mm -hmm. the program because I went to uh, Xinjiang and other provinces in China also. It's very difficult for me to collect some kind of data. Why? The reason. Uh, first, the China lacks the tradition to collect the uh, data. Uh, the second is uh, uh, bureaucratic obstacles. Uh, the third is central and uh, local government uh, delicate uh, relationship. Uh, the, the fourth is uh, next between the mass media and the terrorism. So uh, finally, I uh, just uh, uh, very brief that uh, China uh, dimension approach to terrorism. So the counter law of China uh, take effect this year. They are. Uh, Nine, uh, 97 articles, but uh, in fact, uh, these 90, uh, 97 articles, I think, uh, can be grouped in only three dimensions. Uh, first there is a uh, policy dimension, the second there is a uh, mechanical dimension, and the final is a uh, major dimension. The policy are basic uh, rules guiding system, uh, building and operation are the rational of all communitarian works. The mechanism uh, are institutionalized requirements, organization, procedures, and the protocols. And the majors are tools and the means in line with the policy taken to achieve the above goals. So the, these uh, 97 articles, uh, articles I, I think can be grouped in these three categories, uh, basically. So these uh, five basic rules, uh, I, I will not uh, uh, talk in detail. So, and uh, primary analysis of China approach. So, uh, I think uh, the characters of China approach to terrorism can, could be uh, outlined as this. First, uh, policy dominated approach, because uh, uh, in, in Chinese context, the uh, Ministry of Public Security is centralized, but uh, also very powerful. So, some friends uh, from the United States say that in the United States, the FBI. DHS and other countries, uh, other organization, but, but in China, all these uh, organization the missions uh, come together to Ministry of Public Security, so it's very powerful. The second one is a very hard campaign approach. The uh, third one is a responsive approach intrigued by waves of incident. The fourth is top-down, uh, central to local approach. This approach is determined by the centralized policy uh, police system. And the fifth one wheel driving approach. What does it um, uh, uh, mean? One wheel. One wheel means that the government determine, uh, dominated the sphere of counterterrorism. There is no substantial involvement of public. In other countries, the partnership between government and public is a very important element of counterterrorism architecture. But uh, in China, you, as you know, in most time or so in our time, uh, government in fact uh, very highlights uh, the people's war. Uh, in China against Jap Japanese, nowadays against terrorism. But it's just the idea, a model. The actual implementation of people's war against terrorism faces some obstacles in, China, in Xinjiang and in also in region in China, because you know why? Because uh, the, 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 the relationship between public and the government, in fact, uh, changing a lot uh, from most time to nowadays. So there are problems with China approach. There are problems with China approach are described as a uh, as the following. Uh, for example, the police dominated concern, the other elements of criminal justice especially, and the other partners generally are weakened in terms of the role. And also the strike hard approach tends to be ad, ad hoc and not legally in, in institu in, institutionalized. And third, the responsive approach may mean that the police lag behind terrorism. So just after terrorism attack, though, so government uh, uh, response. So uh, while Chinese police want to proactive, but uh, I think they lack the, some kind of key tools. 
And the top-down uh, approach may overlook uh, lo the locality of terrorism threat in different uh, regions and limit uh, the maneuver space by local actors. And the one wheel driving approach, along with the police dominance approach, may cause the pervasive of, or a passive of other participating organizing or groups. So this kind of problem I just uh, sketched, and also uh, I wrote some kind of implication, just a suggestion for Sino Australia Counterterrorism Corporation. And uh, I will not uh, give you detail. And, uh, so uh, also I thank for your attention, especially thank for your standing my heavy accent and for your comments mm -hmm. and uh, on my personal experience based views and also a uh, heartfelt gratitude to the organizer of this conference and especially for those friends who helped me and make my attendance today full of fear finally yeah, because without the helpful uh, support I cannot uh, come to uh, NU to attend today's conference. Thank you very much. So I now turn over to the discussant for this particular paper, and that is Professor Roderick Broadhurst from the uh, Research School of Social Sciences here at ANU. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. What a, what a tour de force uh, Professor May Jan Ming provided. I have to say, uh, Jan Ming, it was a real pleasure to actually hear you present uh, this talk. Uh, I'd like to share just a tiny little bit of disappointment, if I may. Uh, and that's, I think, probably shared by the rest of us, and that is that that last piece where you were going to share some of your thoughts about um, cooperation, potential ways in which we can cooperate, was the sort of bit that I was going to lead from. Uh, so I'm going to sort of, if you don't, if the audience doesn't mind, I'm going to sort of try to go back and ask Jan Ming to talk just very briefly about some of the key ideas, and particularly the sensitivities around how do we manage to get our counterterrorism cooperation going? I mean, I know it's the, the fighter felon, felon fighter problem that's very central, but I just want to, if that's okay, I want to leave that as a must come back to because in many ways, uh, that was a terrific way to end and I know time's kind of precious, so I'll, I'll cut my chaotic, chaotic sort of blurb about uh, uh, Jan Ming's, uh, you know, really interesting uh, presentation uh, and if you like me this is it was it's nice to have it really is very helpful to have somebody who can kind of bring it all together and if you sense give us the Chinese perspective if I can be so bold uh, and to tr and to sort of train that or to calibrate that against uh, what is an intensely rich history um, uh, for which you know for want of a better word communist doctrine or Marxist Lenin doctrines often had a an interesting kind of struggle with. So I, I don't, you know, I mean, there was some fantastic presentation which, you know, yours truly being, uh, you know, otherwise occupiers couldn't come to where a lot of the sort of kind of stuff that, oh, I shouldn't say stuff, some of the sort of, you know, the kind of violent extremism that we're dealing with and the history and background was presented. But I just wanted to make that point that, you know, uh, Gambling has actually given us a, a really, really strong context in which to evaluate how things have changed in China and how they continuing to evolve and change. Um, but I wanted to sort of kind of lead, um, you know, being a criminologist and sort of very, I guess, probably a bit sort of applied in a way, I, I wanted to tackle that really, uh, the, the ending, the sort of penultimate a bit about the lead role that the Ministry of Public Security plays in the, in, if you like, the, 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 um, the repression or at least the investigation of violent extremism. Now, and I think you made those very important comparisons about how violent extremism, what it means, has changed, particularly over time. And anybody who's been engaged with the Chinese uh, Wong An or the Ministry of Public Security or the Public Security Bureau generally would know uh, <clears throat> that actually uh, the ministry's job, even though it's coordinating from the top, there's a very, very, how can I put it, um, I would say vast variability or difference in the capacities and capabilities of the local policing units and that of central. Uh, and that variation can be very, very significant. By the way, you dropped in a little bit of a surprise for me, Jamie, which I'm delighted that you did. Uh, he mentioned at the end there the, uh, the famous uh, film, I'm forgetting the name, the wonderful actor that said it. And <laughs> Daniel Day-Lewis, thank you. I, I remember him as sort of kind of in a cowboy and Indian film much more vividly. 
But what you did raise there was that's a great example of, uh, of some of the problems that crop up when you, uh, you deal with <clears throat> terrorism in a sort of kind of, in, in a, if you like, I'll call it a, a profiled or stereotypical way that people get caught up in the, in the sort of the stereotypes about what constitutes a violent extremist. Uh, but I wanted to just add this little little bit of I'd, I'd, I'd call it a little bit of what I don't know a little bit of ginger or garlic to spice to that story <laughs> by saying that the really important follow up element of that episode the Guildford Four was that there was an incredibly important and very deep seated change in the way Anglo Saxon or at least common law policing jurisdictions tackled the problem of false confessions and so the lesson that was learned bitterly I have to say uh, in many ways was that, you know, you don't fit up, you don't ter you know, you don't extract uh, unreliable confessions from people who you assume to be terrorists. You have, there's a proper procedure and there's methods that you do. And we've all, at least in the policing fraternity, have learned that lesson well. And, and of course, it's hard to put into practice. But I, I, I'm, I'm constantly reassured when I visit policing agencies practices in China that, that, that the degree of professionals is constantly improving and like us they've embraced things like audio tapes and video re records so that these sorts of events uh, have less likelihood. So I just I wanted to add that one of the follow-ups, the really important follow-up, was this increased concern about how to make sure that when you do investigate these kinds of extreme events, unpleasant and ugly with all the political pressure that goes with them, that we never forget that the fundamental practices of proving an event, uh, you know, at the forefront, and that we don't, you know, in any way. Well I, well, I know you, of course, at the Chinese People's Public Security University, spend quite a good deal of time worrying about the quality of interviews and testimony and so on. So, just to make that's this little aside. Uh, I, so, just to go back to that point about the variability of the capacity of policing agents, since it, since it, they're at the forefront of, if you like, prevention. I, I, I guess I want to ask you, if I, as a breaking ice question, <laughs> it takes a long time to get there. I don't know if you know what the rules are for discussions. Obviously, not to blabber on too much. Um, what the uh, what the basic sort of uh, you know how that presents as a problem, that variability, the fact that the ministry is also kind of the lead organisation in quite a complex security or what we call high policing environment. We've got state security, which we know is terrible, you know, a terribly high degree of efficiency and effectiveness. We've also got the People's Armed Police, which of course have a role to play. And at the same time, given the massive changes that are going on in China, there's all kinds of hotspots everywhere. There's lots of, and we know this, but it's very, very frequent mass disorder. So how is the ministry trying to sort of pull all that together from a top-down point of view when you're also driving a good old-fashioned strike-hard campaign with all its problems? So let me just leave a final at last. Sorry, audience, for being such a pest. Uh, that's my sort of kind of lead question. Okay. Uh, thanks for all those uh, uh, comments and the questions. And in fact, uh, his question uh, uh, raised some uh, uh, very interesting issues. Uh, first, uh, uh, about uh, the bureaucracy of counterterrorism in China. Because uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, Chinese uh, uh, police system is centralized. However, as I mentioned, uh, the threat, uh, terror threat uh, in China, in fact, in different regions uh, are different. For example, in Xinjiang, the uh, most uh, uh, incident happened there, but uh, in other provinces, uh, no, there are no uh, so serious uh, threat. So, however, the uh, Ministry of Public Security is centralized. They want to command uh, all these uh, uh, counterterrorism efforts. So, uh, Ministry of Public Security set uh, the basic uh, lines and uh, strategies and, and the tactics but uh, at the bottom line, the local police uh, uh, sometimes they can use the discretion to find their own way, but sometimes they also complain that uh, ministry, ministry of Public Security don't have some kind of some kind of guideline regarding how to uh, deal in this kind of situation or that kind of situation. So also the, the, this kind of centralized, I think, uh, uh, police system, in fact, uh, I see uh, in some way is a, a high provision, a high proficiency in dealing with some kind of situation. But on the other hand, also the, uh, the local uh, management uh, 
to deal with specific situation also low down. So I think uh, this is the first issue uh, regarding the bureaucracy. Also, another uh, situation uh, issues uh, also in the same issues uh, bureaucracy because uh, public security is also a leading organization, leading agency in the counterterrorism effort. But on the other hand, the paramilitary and also uh, state security uh, uh, operators and other uh, also uh, military also involved mm -hmm. in counterterrorism issues. However, all these elements in counterterrorism efforts they must follow the order by the police. So this is the counterterrorism law. Uh, uh, stabilize the, the basic, uh, this, that means uh, command system uh, in counterterrorism air force. So that means uh, 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 no matter uh, police or PRA or other elements uh, involved in counterterrorism air force, uh, locally, on site, or generally, they must follow the orders by police. Uh, you drew a parallel between the IRA and the situation in Xinjiang. I'm wondering how useful th that comparison actually is. In, in, the, in the Troubles in Ireland, you had two groups going at each other very strongly. Um, the terrorism went, both, went two ways. Um, you have people, the, the main difference was religion ra rather than uh, stronger racial cultural things. Um, in the end, the IRA leaders are now leaders in Northern Ireland. They're in the British Parliament. Um, is, is it really a valid comparison other than that a few bombs went off? Yes, uh, when talking about the IRA and those terrorism group in China, I think uh, that they are uh, uh, some kind of, bear uh, some kind of resemblance and similarities. Uh, for example, both uh, uh, organizations uh, are uh, separatism nat uh, nationalism. For IRA, separate uh, this uh, North Ireland from uh, UK, but uh, also uh, for Chinese, uh, these Uyghur terrorism groups, also the girls uh, want to set a, uh, a separate state uh, apart from China. Uh, but uh, there are many differences, uh, as you point out, that. For example, IRA is uh, the, the, the more violent, and also IRA is, uh, I think, uh, uh, is not so religious. So it's a tra traditional, uh, this kind of, uh, say, uh, not a left but uh, uh, this kind of uh, right, uh, uh, nationalist-based uh, uh, separatism. But uh, for Chinese, this Uyghur uh, terrorism group, uh, the, as I mentioned, the ideology changed. Uh, from traditional to nowadays, uh, this means uh, the uh, radical Islam is a uh, 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 and principal elements of the ideology. So there are bigger differences. And on, on the other hand, the big difference, I think, uh, for example, uh, most of these uh, uh, Uyghur terrorism groups uh, use some kind of uh, self-made uh, tools, uh, weapons, but uh, IRA, as in the movie, as uh, uh, indicated that uh, they're, they're more powerful. So there are many different, and also uh, for the future direction of IRA and uh, and the uh, future direction of uh, this uh, Uyghur terrorism group, I think uh, the maps may be different. Uh, Charles Knight from Charles Sturt. Um, it's quite difficult to agree on quite what terrorism is, but many of our understandings of terrorism say that there's a direct target that's physically attacked, and there's a much bigger target, which is the audience, um, who we're trying to influence. Now, um, in, in discussion, we, could have ideal, we say that if we could break the nexus between the media and the terrorist and the symbiotic relationship that exists there by controlling the media, we could diminish the problem. Now, you draw the Northern Ireland comparison. The British tried that very unsuccessfully, <laughs> um, as you may know. But I imagine that in uh, mainland in China, uh, it's possible to control the media to a far greater extent than it is here. So the question is, to what extent can you mitigate the effects of terrorism by simply not publicising? And indeed, is that more increasingly a problem because? Things like this mean that it's actually impossible to control information. So what degree are you able to control the media and how does that help you in your battle? 
Yeah, uh, this is a, a very uh, important question. Also, I think this issue of the media and the terrorism also not only uh, now a dilemma faced by Chinese government, also is a dilemma faced by uh, many developed countries like the United States and the UK. I remember that uh, there is a great scholar uh, named Paul Wilkinson uh, at uh, St. Andrews University. Also, in his book, uh, uh, Terrorism in Democracy in Democratic Countries, uh, he also noted that uh, uh, this dilemma between media, mass media, and uh, terrorism, in fact, uh, is uh, 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 very uh, obvious and a major problem uh, most uh, dem democratic uh, countries faced. However, nowadays also, uh, I think uh, many years ago, more than uh, uh, 15 or 16 years ago, I read uh, Paul Wilkinson's book, I think, okay, uh, because uh, this kind of media and terrorism uh, relationship is a uh, problem faced by uh, democratic countries. So nowadays, so, so countries like China or Soviet Union, because the media usually uh, tightly controlled by government, so this kind of problem dilemma may not exist for China and uh, other countries. But nowadays, the media relationship, I think, changed uh, from most time to nowadays. So even in China, even government uh, want to uh, carefully, uh, uh, or as, you, as somebody says, they censored some kind of information. But some kind of information, in fact, uh, are difficult because uh, the public can get information from the internet and other source. So, uh, so, so Chinese government, uh, on one hand, uh, carefully control the information about uh, terrorism. That is partly one reason uh, researchers, not only in other countries, but also even in China, we very hard to find information about uh, terrorism. So for me, I want to uh, find some kind of database like uh, those uh, uh, global database in the uh, University of Maryland, but I, I find it very difficult because the media, no media, even in, uh, from uh, document, document of government source, it's also very difficult to find these kind of things. On the other hand, as you, uh, you said, that uh, without the, uh, adequate information, how the public are mobilized to take part in uh, people's war against the terrorism. So the, the, the government must have to balance, balance these kind of two uh, different needs. Dr. May, I just wanted to ask you a, a couple of um, brief questions. Um, the first one is, uh, you, you outlined these transit routes that we've been talking about, the sort of northern route through Heilongjiang and, and through Russia and, and the southern route. Um, there have been some analysis that these, some of these routes, particularly the southern and southeast Asian routes, there'd been some effectiveness in shutting them down to a very significant degree in the last couple of years. What, what is your assessment of uh, the kind of flow of uh, people now moving through these routes in Southeast Asia and, and, and even the kind of what must be a much smaller number through the, through the northern routes? How, how successful do you think China's been in shutting these down? Um, and then one issue that wasn't covered that I was a little curious about, um, what, do you ha what distinct policy challenges have been posed by some of the efforts at recruitment of non-Uyghur uh, uh, groups in China? Um, there have been uh, s uh, some, it appears that a very, very small number of Hui Muslims had um, shown up in Syria um, as well. I'd just be curious to get your assessment of what uh, distinct difficulties and, and new elements this might have introduced to thinking about uh, counterterrorism policy in China. Thank you for your two questions. And uh, uh, regarding the first one, and I think uh, because in my papers I just uh, mentioned a general model, like uh, uh, terrorism and the terror and the counterterrorism, in fact, both are uh, mostly effectively adapted to the different uh, environment. When the environment changes, also terrorism changes the MO. And uh, similarly, also counterterrorism efforts, uh, counterterrorism uh, agency also need uh, adapt to the new environment, uh, like uh, using of uh, new technology to fight back. So, uh, in uh, uh, about your specific questions, uh, for example, these uh, uh, travel routes of terrorism groups, uh, uh, north or south. In fact, as long as those those groups uh, like water, like water, they they all, all uh, usually. Uh, fly from the height to the low place. The, these groups also must find some kind of weakness. As long as uh, that specific region, their weakness, they can 
uh, get away from the uh, law enforcement agency, they would find this place is a route to go abroad. So uh, when Xinjiang, uh, I think border control is very uh, tight, so they want to go to other parts of China, north or south, to go uh, abroad. Uh, in past months, uh, I think uh, uh, pub, uh, Public Security Bureau and the Department uh, and uh, find some kind of these kind of uh, new uh, patterns of uh, travel routes. So in North Route in Xinjiang, in, in Heilongjiang, and also South Route in uh, Yunnan and in Guangxi, I think the border control is very tight. However, as I said, these kind of weaker groups must find some kind of place of weakness. For example, uh, in uh, one province in North China, I, I visited and uh, interview and discuss local police. Police said that we have found some kind of groups of Uyghur. Uh, uh, once these groups visit here and also they communicate each other, say, how about the local police? They monitor us communication. So please, because use some kind of uh, uh, monitor technology to find that this kind of thread, though. So local police uh, uh, strike and uh, this kind of group finally uh, withdraw from the, the rules from uh, in, in one province in China. So this kind of thing, I think, uh, uh, north or south uh, travel rules change uh, depends. And also the, the second issue is, uh, apart from uh, Uyghurs also, there may be uh, some kind of other groups, uh, for example, as you said, Hui or others, uh, be interested in use some kind of violence, but I'm not sure. I don't have some kind of uh, special data or case uh, regarding this. Also, I just uh, uh, added one uh, 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 information that uh, I don't have time to show uh, Islam states. In fact, uh, last year issued one Chinese song, uh, song in Mandarin Chinese and uh, released on the internet. So I think this kind of IS, uh, uh, media, in fact, want to target some kind of uh, audience rather than Uyghurs. Professor, when you, in both your examples of the Uyghur and the IRA, you linked the goal of political autonomy with terrorism. How does China's CT policy distinguish between a legitimate, uh, legitimate political dissent and the desire for self-determination and terrorism. Uh, yes, and I think the Chinese government that uh, uh, so-called self-determination is very clear. And uh, as uh, uh, this morning, uh, Dr. Roberts said that uh, in fact, in 1955, the Chinese uh, government, central government, uh, uh, set up uh, set up some kind of mechanism of uh, uh, Xinjiang Uyghur autonomous region. This kind of mechanism. In fact, this kind of uh, 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 policy, in fact, want to give uh, local minority some kind of uh, self-determination. But uh, uh, I think the Chinese perception of uh, self-determination may be different from those, for example, uh, uh, Irish, North Irish, this kind of concept. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, in the bottom line, no matter what kind of uh, self-determination or others, uh, they are some kind of uh, basic uh, Line, for example, uh, for whatever reason, or for whatever what kind of cause, people cannot, uh, uh, in the name of self determination, to fight to uh, to to kill innocent. This is, uh, I think, uh, is uh, the basic line. So no matter in uh, UK, in IRA, or in China, in uh, Uyghur terror group, uh, as uh, the short media I just said that. Uh, no, uh, the, that uh, older man is a uh, bystander, but uh, those uh, uh, violent group uh, use uh, knives to kill these uh, bystanders. So I think uh, terrorism must have some kind of reason. Uh, the reason can be uh, explained in different way, but uh, whatever, uh, no matter what the reason is, the basic line must be obeyed, that uh, the human being, the human life cannot be uh, deprived in, for whatever reason. Thank you, Marina Tsuribas from the National Security College, and um, thank you very much for your presentation, Professor. Um, the previous 
question touched a little bit on this, uh, but I'd like um, to hear your perspectives. On the one hand, I suppose we are talking about um, a group that to a certain extent wants more autonomy is racially distinct, bounded by a land area. But on the other hand, what we are hearing is there's this overlay of extremist violent Islam and the threat of ISIS or Al-Qaeda affiliates increasingly becoming influential globally, but also in China. The ISIS, as we all agree, is a terrible group which uses horrific methods. What I would be interested in hearing about, and we're struggling with this in the West, is how do you address the appeal, or the sex appeal in inverted commas, of ISIS as a group to disenfranchised young men? What would be a Chinese perspective about how you tackle the ideological appeal of a group like ISIS? Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, uh, if I understand your point correctly, I think you mean uh, how Chinese uh, come back uh, uh, the as uh, extreme narrative and come back, right? Uh, yes, and uh, as uh, I know that uh, in past uh, years, uh, because after uh, September 11, uh, in most countries, uh, for example, uh, the, the specific case is uh, the United States and uh, some countries uh, use the war, use the, uh, 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 some kind of force uh, to fight back uh, domestically or internationally. But uh, based, in fact, also, uh, based on Chinese experience, Chinese also find that, uh, as uh, we online, that Chinese terrorism threat, in fact, uh, lasted long, uh, several decades. But uh, why nowadays this kind of threat uh, became grave? So Chinese, uh, I think, uh, academic and also uh, practitioner also uh, consider ref reflectively why this situation in China uh, also became grave, like those situations in other countries. So that means just a resort to use of violence, the force may be programmed. So Chinese government also uh, launched some kind of program in other countries like de-radicalization. So in uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, in UK, also in, in, in Russia and also in uh, Australia, the de-radicalization de strategy is very important to counter, counter the narrative of, for extremism ideology. So in China also, uh, especially in Xinjiang, the uh, central and the local government also launched similar programs. But also, uh, I also want to add that uh, uh, also, uh, Chinese uh, counterterrorism law uh, stipulated uh, some kind of mechanism of uh, de-radicalization assessment. That means inmate after release from the pre uh, prisoner prison, uh, they must be assessed uh, the threat, the potential threat after release. So Chinese government said that uh, they must kind kind of some uh, assessment. But uh, in fact, uh, at a practical level. Uh, uh, I don't think we have some kind of adequate tools to carefully or scientifically to assess which guys after release they have some kind of spectral harassment. So this is the issue. I think as an academic we need to study further. Thank you very much, uh, Professor May, for a very uh, interesting presentation. I wanted to ask a very specific question. Uh, which in some ways draws on what um, uh, our discussant was talking about, looking at sort of international cooperation, to talk about uh, the relationship with Turkey um, in sort of CT cooperation terms. Um, I know historically it's been difficult. I'm wondering what is the current sort of state of the relationship with China, between China and Turkey, looking specifically at sort of CT questions? Uh, this uh, international cooperation, I think, uh, uh, because in, in, in my final part, I also address uh, this uh, international cooperation uh, strategy. For China, the international cooperation strategy is very uh, highly prioritized. But uh, on the other hand, uh, Chinese government also, uh, in past years, uh, don't want uh, to uh, play some kind of high profile in international uh, counterterrorism efforts uh, because there are several, uh, several reasons. However, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, those incidents happened in 2015. Those uh, incidents, uh, in fact, uh, raised uh, the overseas security for China. So Chinese government, uh, in fact, uh, highly prioritized uh, the international cooperation uh, with other countries. Nowadays, for example, I know uh, I attend a, a training program 
jointly sponsored by FBI or United States and uh, China Ministry of Public Security. I, I also uh, academic advisor to China and the French Counterterrorism Corporation. I'm the only uh, academic advisor from Chinese side. Also, and uh, uh, later this year, I think uh, United States and uh, China will uh, set up a, a very high level uh, counterterrorism dialogue uh, issues. So, uh, in terms of uh, your uh, raised uh, specific cooperation with uh, Turkey, I think it's very difficult uh, nowadays for Chinese government to set up uh, this kind of uh, dialogue. Ne nevertheless, I think the Chinese government must uh, think carefully, uh, must face the music uh, to cooperate with uh, the Turkey government in some way. In fact, uh, uh, when I was uh, in, in the university, I also uh, met some uh, colleagues from uh, uh, Turkey's uh, national police and also from other countries uh, for exchange. Okay, so um, I think we might go back to Ian um, your point because I think that leads in on yeah. Sino Australian cooperation. Uh, if we can just have a bit of a, a chat about that now in terms of what you foresee in, in, in terms of Sino Australian cooperation. Yeah, I think uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, issues is very important because as uh, uh, earlier uh, speakers raised that, for example, Chinese Uyghur also uh, arrested and presents in Southeast Asia. And also Southeast Asia for Australia, in fact, uh, is uh, the, the gate uh, of national security front. So if uh, uh, for the... Uh, uh, growing of this kind of legal threat in Southeast Asia. I think, uh, for example, uh, uh, while attacking of uh, this kind of legal group uh, in Central Asia or West Asia and in other places, this kind of uh, threat may spread to the lower place, as I said, as I mentioned, because those uh, groups also uh, want to use kind of, some kind of weakness of uh, some specific place. So in determining, uh, considering this kind of uh, dimension, I think uh, China and uh, Australia cooperation, cooperation is very important. However, uh, this kind of cooperation of also is very difficult uh, to propose in some way, because uh, as you uh, see that uh, South China Sea, this kind of program, in fact, uh, make China and Australia relationship, in fact, uh, in some way, uh, low down in some way, and also uh, very sensitive. So I say that uh, even if uh, not only China also, but also Chinese government want to propose uh, this kind of counterterrorism cooperation, but how uh, and in which way the China or Australian government raise these issues to the opposite side. And also uh, in which way, for example, uh, uh, in which field, the cooperation, the counterterrorism cooperation could be conducted. Uh, intelligence exchange or some kind of uh, for the uh, cooperation, for example, set up some kind of regional uh, counterterrorism uh, platform uh, uh, for Southeast Asian countries and also China and uh, Australia both play a key role in this platform. And also, for example, uh, 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 using some kind of uh, uh, current resource like uh, uh, Australia and Indonesia, uh, Jakarta Law Enforcement Training Corporation, this kind of center. So how Chinese uh, uh, current police and the personnel will be involved in this kind of training program. So I think this kind of issues uh, need to consider further for the, uh, China and Australia uh, counterterrorism cooperation. Uh, nevertheless, as I mentioned, China has uh, set up some kind of uh, bilateral or multilateral cooperation with, uh, uh, for example, Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization and uh, even uh, other Central Asia countries. In fact, uh, Central Asia countries and Russia, I think, uh, uh, have a lot of uh, cooperation with the Chinese government. Uh, uh, meanwhile, Chinese government have some kind of bilateral cooperation with uh, France, with uh, uh, UK, this kind of, uh, uh, I think, uh, this kind of relationship between China and the UK seems uh, getting warmer. 
and uh, more substantial, and also so how uh, uh, China and uh, Australia cooperation, uh, concurrent cooperation, will be uh, proposed. I think uh, is uh, should be promising. Can I just chuck in, just <clears throat> throw in, I should say, and throw in a, a point about that because we we already have at least on paper and in practice quite a good arrangement for uh, dealing with fugitives. So fugitives from China and fugitives from Australia who committed ordinary crime, for want of a better word. How could that be, you know, kind of lifted up to be more effective? Uh, I mean, I know that there are some constraints, but I, I just, just, just since it's already operating, you know, how, how could we sort of make that work more effectively from your point of view? Yeah, and uh, uh, in past year, Chinese government uh, also uh, strengthened some kind of uh, Oversee uh, fugitive operation. So uh, most of them uh, through the Interpol, Interpol, and uh, so uh, the Interpol and other uh, bilateral uh, channel, uh, in fact, uh, are used by Chinese government uh, as a major channel to uh, dealing with kind of overseas uh, fugitive uh, issues. However, uh, when uh, dealing with this kind of fugitive also. Uh, some kind of uh, very important issue, for example, uh, financing, financing of uh, this kind of uh, uh, fugitives, also financing of uh, terrorism, I think is a challenging job for Chinese government and also partners in other countries. Thank you.